All right, so real quick, um, let's go to Matthew 21, and I'm just going to read to you right now verses 1 through 17, because it's Palm Sunday. How many of us know that? All right. Got one more Sunday to Easter, got Good Friday coming. But it says, now when they drew near to Jerusalem, they came to Bethage and to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village in front of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord needs them and he will send them at once. Isn't that amazing? That's just kind of cool. Where somebody tell me that? Go pick up two cars and then bring them back. Never in mind. The Lord needs them. All right. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble, mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed. They brought the donkey and the colt and put them, put on them their cloaks, and he and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and they followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up. Everybody say stirred up. Mm -hmm. Saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus. Mm -hmm. From Nazareth of, of Galilee. And, he, and Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. Pigeons. How many of y'all, pigeons, they, they're a nuisance. Anyway, anyway. I mean, I'm just glad they were selling some of those pigeons. You know what I'm saying? He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you shall make it, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priest and the scribes saw the wonderful things he did and that the children were crying out in the temple, Hosanna to, son of the, the, to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what they are saying? And Jesus said, yes, have you never heard? Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have prepared praise. And leaving them, he went out to the city of Bethany and lodged there. Heavenly Father, we pray today, God, that you will just help us to hear your word. Lord, that your word will change and your word will transform us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. So this is Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday 2024. And we are beginning the celebration of Christ's passion, the Holy Week. So this morning, this coming, and th this morning, this coming Friday at 7, and the next Sunday morning is Resurrection Sunday, we're going to impact three aspects of Christ's life and ministry of what he did and what he still does today. This morning, we're going to look at how he provoked. We're going to, on Good Friday, we're going to talk about how he provided, and then on Resurrection Sunday, we're going to talk about how he proved. But today, I want to talk to you about, listen, the provoking ministry of Jesus. Just provoke somebody close to you right now. Provoke them. Provoke them in the name of the Lord. So I want you to think about this. When we hear that word provoke, we tend to have a negative connotation, don't we? We, we tend to have a negative thought. For the most part, that is how the word is even used within Scripture. So defining it biblically, it means this, provoke means to call forth. It means to excite or to stir up. In the, in the Old Testament, it actually means this, to make angry. As in when Israel rebelled against the Lord, they incited his anger against them. In the New Testament, it is used also for that, to make angry or to embitter, but it's also used in a good sense to make jealous. Paul even said this about his, his, his Jewish uh, people. He said that even the Gentiles are being saved, and hopefully it will incite jealousy in them so that they too might be saved. So as I was looking this up, as I was looking at this word, and I was looking up the word, not only the biblical meaning, but then just looking at some different um, 
different definitions of that word provoke. Listen to this. It means to call forth, and I like this. Hear it, real, hear, hear it very good, and think about this with Jesus. His provoking ministry. It means to stir purposely, to provide the needed stimulus. What brought most of us to the Lord was a provoking. Wasn't it? It was getting stirred in some way. It was a stimulus in some way. It was the Holy Spirit drawing us to God. And it might have even been a condition that we had. Maybe it was, um, maybe we were, maybe we were down on our luck. Maybe, maybe things just weren't working out correctly. I, I don't know about you, but the Lord's provoked me a lot through the years. And he's, I, I'm sure that he's provoked you. This is when y'all go silent on me. I say, the Lord's provoked me, and y'all all look at me because you needed it, Pastor. We don't need provoking. I know how y'all are. I see it. But to call for it to stir purposely to provide the needed stimulus, that is God. The Holy Spirit is always desiring us to go on in the Spirit, to keep growing in Him, because He wants to stir us up to action. That brings me to the remainder of this definition because provoking can have one or two effects on us. <laughs> Y'all know if you had a sibling who provoked you, you know one of the reactions. Anger, frustration, irritation. It can stir up something that's not good inside of you. It can make you go, man, that's just provoking me. You are provoking me to anger. But it can also agitate us stimulate us to change for the good. So I want to look at these things. How, who, and why did Jesus provoke? How, who, and why? I think most of us know that Jesus provoked people to faith, right? But there are also some people that he provoked to anger. But, but how did he provoke? Can I tell you how he provoked? He provoked, the people that he provoked when he was on the earth, the first go-round, was this. He provoked people by doing his Father's work. Isn't that amazing? By doing his Father's work. And look, when Christ came on the scene, let me just say this. The earth was a mess. How many of y'all know when he comes back, it's going to be a mess too? Amen? When he returns the second time. But in this, listen, he... He provoked them because, first off, we need to understand something. The Pharisees and, the, and the, the scribes and the Pharisees at this time, they ruled the day. They ruled the day. They were even in cahoots with the Roman government. There were some who were called, even a sect of the Jews called Herodians. They were actually for Herod the Great. They were like, hey, Herod's great. He's wonderful. We're behind him. And then the Pharisee, the scribes and the Pharisees were holding on to their rules and their regulations that they had heaped on top of the law of God that didn't have anything to do with the law of God, but it made them feel holy. It made, y'all hear me? Made them feel holy. It made them feel righteous, but even they couldn't keep up with what, with even the rules that they had put in. So when Christ comes on the scene, he comes in as kind of a rebel. He, he is against their religious system. He is one who is a threat to their way of life because if he disrupts some things, if he even leads a rebellion against the Roman government, which many had come before him had tried to do that, then he also really, honestly, he socialized with the wrong crowd. He didn't just hang out with the Pharisees and the scribes. They would have been okay with him then. No, no, we're going to look at this in a minute. And he also, get this now, he was a threat to their religious system because he didn't, he lacked respect for their man-made traditions. Woo! So when we look at this, Let's look at some things that, that provoked them. First off, he forgave sin. That was a big no-no. He also healed a lame man. In Mark chapter 2, verse 1, it says this, And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. 
And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. So Jesus has become popular at this moment. He was preaching the word to them, and they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, listen to what he said. He said, your son, your sins are forgiven. Uh Uh-oh. Then it says, now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts. (laughs) How many of y'all know this? Isn't that bad? That they were questioning in their hearts, but Jesus heard their hearts talking. Have y'all ever gone, you know, I'm not going to say it, Lord, because I don't want you to hear it. (laughs) You know? And and God's already like, I already got it. I got it. I got the dictation right here. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, what does this man, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God? And it wasn't like Jesus did like a, now, now, it wasn't like he did a dramatic pause. It said, and immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit, that they questioned within themselves, said to them. Could y'all imagine thinking something? And then he goes, uh, by the way, what you just thought, come on. How many of y'all know that? <laughs> That's like, that y'all be like, huh? Me? Moi? No, it was them. It was them, Lord. He said, why do you question these things? It's in your hearts. <laughs> I mean, I can, I'm just telling you, I, I, I can only imagine. I, I can just only imagine, like, you remember when you used to get caught doing stuff and you thought nobody knew? And you're like, how'd you know that? It's because your parents did that when they were kids. Do y'all understand that? Okay, so they have an inside, they have an inside lane. So he says, which is easier? To say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. Now imagine everybody else is sitting here watching this dialogue going, is he really about to say that? I mean, come on, we're about to see a miracle in our midst, okay? But that you may know, get this, that you may know what? The Son of Man has authority on earth earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. Wow. And then it says, and he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God saying, we never saw anything like this. Remember how many times they said he is one who speaks with authority. He teaches with authority. He doesn't just teach with words. He teaches with authority. Not only did he teach with authority, he demonstrated authority. Now, I want to tell you something. This provoked the religious people, though. Two things that he did. He forgave sins and he healed a man. That would tick me off, too. Wouldn't that just make you mad? See a lame man get up and walk out of the room? Can you believe he did that? How many of y'all would just be like, man, like praise God from whom all blessings flow? How about this one? How about this? He called a tax collector. Yes, he did. Do y'all know tax collectors were hated? Do y'all know anyone? They still are? Somebody just said still are? Hey, when I first got here to this church, there were two, two saints, and they were both retired IRS workers, and they counted our offering, and not ever was a, a cent missing. I just want to tell you, we did have to pay taxes to them later, but no, no, no. But they were, they were amazing. They were amazing. But God redeemed a tax collector. A tax collector was in cahoots with the Roman government. A tax collector exhorted, they would normally, they would take some and skim some off the top and then turn that in. 
So they were like not the pedigree of the Jewish people. But look what it says in Mark chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. It says he calls a tax collector, a sinner. He went out again beside the sea and all the crowd was coming to him and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. Just as he passed by. Can you imagine that? Like Jesus knew, right? He knew his 12. He had already prayed. He had already asked the Father. So then he's just walking by and he goes, hey, will you follow me? And the guy gets up immediately and follows. Now, I just want to tell you right now, that, that's going to tick some people off. Because that guy's not supposed to be in the elite. He's not supposed to be in that part of the crowd. <laughs> you know what? It was really interesting. My wife was captain of the cheerleading team when we were in high school. My wife was homecoming queen the year before she, um, the year that she graduated, right? Senior year, homecoming queen. I was a year behind Carrie. We had a class together. She fell deeply in love with me. <laughs> she just couldn't help herself. I knew the handwriting was on the wall. I had no idea. I'll just be honest with you. Uh, she was like, I mean, you know, she was just a really good friend. We were, we were buddies, you know. I never would have even thought, hey, we would end up together. But here's the interesting thing. So I went and did the funerals for some friends of mine from high school for their mother this past Sunday. And so as we're sitting after the, after the, after the funeral, we're sitting at one of the homes, and, and they just said, hey, Tim, like, how did you end up <laughs> with Karen Dyer? I said, well, what do you, what do you mean? <laughs> I mean, like, what? <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> they said, no, no, like, she was like in a different league. I mean, she was like part of a different crowd. I was like, well, I, I kind of mingled over on that side, you know. <laughs> no, and I, I told them the story. I told them how we were friends in high school and how we had stayed in touch even as she went to college. And then, of course, when I came back from the military, and I do, I feel like it was the Lord that put us together because it was even that weekend that both of us kind of had a turnaround. Uh, for Christ, um, you know, or at least God put the seed within our hearts, but that was the weekend. The weekend that I saw her, and we weren't dating at the time, the weekend that I saw her was the weekend that he delivered me from drugs, okay? Never used them again from that point forward, uh, and it wasn't until like three or four months later that we actually went out on our first date, and I had no idea. I was just praying for a Christian woman, and she was praying for a Christian man, so God just got us both going in the right direction and then put us together. But I got to tell you something. It is strange. It was strange to them, and I said, because God works miracles. God can take a tax collector, a drug dealer, a murderer. Come on, somebody. He can take every person from any stage in life or any walk of life or even any occupation and save them and redeem them. So praise the Lord for that. So he called a tax collector. The next thing that he did, and I know this is going to be way out of sorts, he provoked people because he ate with people who needed him. Did you hear that? He like associated with some people who needed him. How dare he? If you're saved, you ought to hang with saved people. And that's it. Don't have any influence. Don't say hello to your neighbor. Do they go to church? And what church do they attend? You know what I'm saying? Boy, we used to be that way so bad, didn't we? Well, are you a Baptist? Are you a Baptist? I'm a Baptist. Well, we can get married if we're both Baptists. Well, are you Pentecostal? You're Pentecostal. I can't. Mm -mm, no, sorry. Love you, but got to go. Mark chapter 2, look at this, verse 15, and it says, And as he reclined at the table in his house, whose house? Levi. You mean to tell me he called a guy that's sitting at the tax collector's table, now he's in his house? That was a no-no. It says, many tax collectors, uh-oh, 
You mean Levi invited some friends? Oh, tax collectors and sinners in, in his house. I'm ashamed. You know what? We ought to open our doors. Come on. More and more to people who need the Lord. It says, he was reclining with Jesus and his disciples. We're reclining with Jesus and his disciples. Reclining. Now, they meant reclining. Y'all know they didn't sit in chairs. Isn't it cool how they sat? I mean, they sat so that you could take a nap right after you ate. You didn't have to move from the table to the sofa. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you eat, sack out right there. It says, and the scribes and the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Get this. So the disciples were like, what are we going to tell them? When Jesus heard it, he said, don't you know that they didn't? I bet they were thinking, we're not going to say anything. No, if we don't say anything, he still hears us. So we're out of luck. When Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous but sinners. Aren't we glad? I said, aren't we glad? Of such we, come on, of such are we. There is no unrighteous, none but one. Amen? And we've all been saved by grace, not by works that any of us should boast. It's not our righteousness, it's his righteousness. And he saved us while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Hallelujah. I'm just so grateful. Here Jesus is sitting at the table, and he's like, listen. First off, y'all think y'all got it. Y'all don't have it. But these people need my help. And here's the interesting thing. Isn't it good when we know we need his help? He ate with people who actually needed him. How about this? Oh, and this was a big no-no. He healed a man on the Sabbath. He did what? Can, can I share something with you about the laws that the Pharisees had? Let me just share it with you real quick. This is out of a commentary. It says, it's important to note that Jesus was not violating the law of God when he healed on the Sabbath. He was surely acting against the pharisaical interpretation of the law and against their particular rules. But the Holy One of God, who came to fulfill the law, did not violate the law. The basic reason that Jesus healed on the Sabbath was that people needed his help. Jesus healed on the Sabbath also in order to reveal the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. In three passages where Jesus was healing led to a confrontation, Jesus references how the Jews worked on the Sabbath Listen to this, by taking care of their animals, that work was sanctioned by the Pharisees. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. There are religions out there today, here, let, me hear, let, me, let me just tell you, that will compartmentalize the rules to meet what they need. Come on. Here they had, they had, they had taken the rules and made them to meet their need. We need the beast of burden. We need our animals for the sustenance of our life. Therefore, you can handle your animals. You can take care of your animals, but you can't take care of humans. Sounds like save the whales, kill the babies. Come on. We'll sanction, we'll, look, we're going to law, we're going to protect. This animal, somebody, he said this. He said, this work was sanctioned by the Pharisees. <laughs> so Jesus says, hey, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or your donkey from the stall and lead it to give it water? He said that in Luke chapter 13. And he rightly calls out their hypocrisy for denying healing. 
See, I, I, want you, I want to give you some of the rules that the Pharisees had. You can't, I, I, I can't wait. You know, I, I mean, it's amazing how we'll say, now listen, don't work on the Sabbath, yet we'll go to a restaurant and somebody will serve us. It says, the Pharisees' Sabbath restrictions forbade the following activities. Get this, writing. Some of y'all have no problem with that, like thank you. Erasing. Tearing, conducting business transactions, shopping. Don't stop by Publix. Although they do have good fried chicken. Just letting you know. Cooking, baking, kindling a fire, gardening, doing laundry, carrying anything. <laughs> doing laundry. Somebody was like, thank you, Lord. Yes, I'm receiving that. Okay. Carrying anything more than six feet in a public area. You can carry it five feet. But don't you carry it six. That, this is amazing. Moving anything with your hand, even directly with a broom, even indirectly with a broom, a broken bowl, flowers in a vase, candles on a table, raw food, a rock, a button that came off. You could move things with your elbow or your breath, but not with your hand. Hey, can you get that button over here? Yeah, hang on. I mean, is that just not crazy? Here, move it with your elbow. Come on. How many of y'all, listen, is this, it, it, it's man-made rules. It's man-made regulations. And here Jesus comes in. Here Jesus comes in to heal somebody. L listen to the exchange. Mark chapter 3. Talk about provoking some people, but, but I believe this was a setup too. It says, again, he entered the synagogue and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched who? The Pharisees. They watched Jesus. What is he going to do? Is he going to take pity on that withered hand, man? Think about it. Much of that meant that that man had been cursed of God because he had an infirmity. Come on. They watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. <laughs> I often wonder, did they find like that withered man on the way there? Hey, come with us to the synagogue. Jesus will be there. We really long for you to be healed. Mm. What a mess religion was in that day. And then Jesus comes on the scene. In Matthew, um, Matthew 23, let me just read this to you real quick before I continue. Matthew 23, he tells the Pharisees, he gives the Pharisees a woe. Here's what he says to them. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. For you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Wow. He said, look, you're shutting yourself out and you're shutting everybody else out. Because you're hypocritical in what you're doing. See, I want to tell you something. Listen to me. It wasn't about relationship with God. It was about rules and regulations. When it becomes about rules and regulations, guess what we do? We make up our own as we go. How about the grace of God? How about the goodness of God? So here Jesus is on the scene. He knows their hearts. He knows what he is going to do. So he provokes for the good of the man with the withered hand. Isn't it good to know, hey, that no matter what anybody else is thinking, he's there to heal. I never will forget when I quit worrying about people around me during worship and I just started to worship. How liberating. How liberating just to say, God, I just love you. Lord, I love you. I wouldn't lift my hands for a long time because I was so self-conscious. I thought everybody was focused on me. I'm like, boy, that was a lie. 
They were focused on the Lord. I was the one focused on myself. Mark chapter 3, verse 3, and says, He said to the man with the withered hand, Come here. And he said to them, Look at this. He said to the Pharisees, <laughs> He knew this is a setup. He says, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save a life or to kill? Oh, Could y'all imagine just how they look? I know my face is animated, and I apologize. I'm just thinking. Could you? And then, then what does it say? They're, I bet you that they were like, see, Jesus provoked, provoked for a reason. He was calculated and purposeful in his provocation just like he is with us he provokes us for a reason and the reason for this was to show the hardness of their own hearts look at verse 5 which is interesting it says and he looked around at them with anger he knew this was a setup but then these are the words that struck me grieved at their hardness of heart. You know, sometimes we go, yeah, they're hard-hearted. Kill them, God. No, the Lord grieves a hard heart. Lord, soften that heart. It says, grieved at their hardness of heart, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out. And he was restored. Wow. What a rule breaker Jesus was. What a, what a healer. What a savior. What a king. <laughs> Healing a man on the Sabbath. <laughs> and what was the response of the Pharisees? Hardness of heart. What should it have been? You are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. Remember John the Baptist when he got put in prison? And he said to his disciples, he said, hey, listen, I want you to go and I want you to ask Jesus. Because even he, the forerunner of Christ, the one who baptized him, the one who heard, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to me. Doubt can come in on us. We can wonder, God, do you hear me? He said to his disciples, go ask him, is he the one or should we expect and wait for another? Jesus said, I tell you what, go tell John the Baptist. The gospel is preached to the poor. The blind see, the deaf hear, and the lame walk. Woo! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that's all John needed to hear. That's all he needed to hear. Yes, Lord, thank you for the confirmation. Wow. Verse number six says, The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians. Those were Pharisees in opposition to Jesus who had assumed to be supporters of Herod the Great. They came and they held counsel with the Herodians against him on how to destroy him. There's another thing that he did. How about this one? He delivered those possessed of demons. Doggone it. How did he do that? Well, so when he delivered those possessed of demons, they didn't think that was the work of God. They said, you have the spirit of Satan himself. Boy, you want to talk about a bad day? I mean, like, I'm just looking for some kind of like, great job, phenomenal. But see, it waxed against what they wanted. It waxed against their society standing. As a matter of fact, it made them look a little powerless. Ooh. 
You know what? If we ever think that the gifts are ours and not bestowed from him, we're in trouble. Have you ever noticed that? I, you know, I, I've known, and I know you've seen this. You've seen people of God, even ministers of God, who have started off with a pure heart, and then all of a sudden we think it's us and not him. That's when we fall into error. Look at Mark chapter 3, verse 22. It said, And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebub. Oh, there we go. And by the prince of demons, he cast out demons. And he called to them and said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? <laughs> Makes good sense to me. If a kingdom is divided against itself, that, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then he indeed may plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. He said, what you are doing because they were saying he had an unclean spirit. He said, what you're doing is attributing the works of God to the works of Satan. Wow. <laughs> Pharisees were not having a good day. Do y'all see this? If you read all through the Gospels, he provoked them, provoked them, provoked them. He even called them like, you're not, your father's not Abraham. See, he, he doubled back on them. Father's not Abraham. Your father is the devil. Not a good day. Not a good day if you're a Pharisee. <laughs> right? I mean, how many of y'all? Like, I know you're here, but you're possessed. And I just call you out on Sunday morning. Wouldn't be a good day. Here's not a good day. He provoked them. But get this. Not only did he provoke the Pharisees, he also provoked his own family. A lot of times we don't even look at that. I mean, we know, you know, that they came around, right? James, his half-brother, writes one of the books of the New Testament. But get this. He, his own family, Mark chapter 3, verse 20. Then he went home and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying what? He is out of his mind. Do you know when I got saved, I had somebody in my family tell me, don't take this too seriously. Serious. Because I, I quit my drugs, and I like started to clean up other things in my life. The Lord did. He began to clean up other things in my life, and so I had decided I was going to stop smoking. Because I just felt like that was physically bad for me. And I had somebody come to me and say, hey, don't take this too seriously. So you know what? Actually, I went two steps forward and like three steps back. So I, I was just kind of like, well, maybe I, I don't need, listen to me. Don't call somebody to stumble. You trust God for everything that he has for you. And you believe him for it. I said last week, I said, we want you to win. Listen to me. The Lord can deliver us from everything. We just have to submit it to him and ask his help. Amen? God, I submit my life to you. My life is completely and totally yours. Lord, I'm asking you to rid me of all my bad habits and everything else, God. I bring them before you because you are king of kings and you are Lord of lords. And you have the power and the ability to, to, to rid me of these things that are hampering my life. Can I get an amen on that? So take away my selfish desires. Take away my unclean thoughts. Help me to take every captive thought to you, to the obedience of Christ. But in this, when he's sitting here and he's like, even his own family was against him. Like when he was in the house with the paralytic, you remember, he's in there and, there, and, and his mother and his, and his siblings are outside and they're saying, hey, your mother and your siblings are calling for you 
And he says, you are my mothers, my brothers, my sisters. If you do the will of the Father, this is my family. You know, the awesome thing with my son right now is he's all the way up in Minnesota. But I told him, he told me, he said, man, I really miss my family. You know, he said, he's going through some things right now. He said, I really miss my family. I really wish I was home with my family. And I said, you have family. It's just not us. And guess what? He's had brothers in the Lord reach out to him. He's had fathers in the Lord reach out to him. He's had mothers in the Lord reach. Come on. He's had mothers in the faith. That's what I mean. He's had brothers in the faith. He's had sisters in the faith reach out. I said, be careful with the sisters. But he's had sisters in the faith reach out to him. Yeah, sometimes like, no, 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 no. No, no, no. Sisters, yeah, just remember they're your sisters. <laughs> Amen. And he's had others reach out to him. But that's the great thing about being part of the family. But in this, Jesus' earthly family is actually saying he's insane. I mean, you think about it. How did the people go from saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord on one day to saying, crucify him just really hours later, two days later? Wow, how quickly our emotions can change. We better trust the Holy Spirit of God, right? Woo! So, how he provoked, who did he provoke? He provoked the rulers of the day. Both religious and governmental. He provoked the rulers of the day, both religious and governmental. Did y'all hear me? Who will he provoke today? Both the religious and the governmental. He will. It's just who Jesus is. He'll also provoke us. I want to be provoked by the Lord. I do. I want him to say, hey, Tim, no. No. This is the way I want you to go. This is what I want you to do. So why did he provoke? He provoked them for change. And then, listen, so, oh, and I think I wrote something wrong on that. But anyway, listen, listen to this real quick. So that's who he provoked in Mark chapter 7. Look at what he says. Mark chapter 7, verse number 1. I think I've got this in. I do. Now, when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw, and I'm going to ask the worship team to come if they will. They saw some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews did not eat unless they washed their hands properly. Uh-oh, get this, get this. Holding to what? The tradition of the elders, not the law, the tradition of the elders. Come on. You know, when everybody was talking during COVID about like wash your hands before you eat, I was like, that's a new thing? Like, no wonder we're all sick. Nobody's washing. The Come on. Some of this is just cleanliness, right? And they say cleanliness is next to godliness or something along those lines. Here we go. Do not eat unless they wash. And there were many other traditions that they observed, such as washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. Wow. Upholstery cleaning. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the... But eat with defiled hands. And he said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? Is this a provoking? I think this is intentional, isn't it? As it is written, the people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold on to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your own tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father and mother, whatever you have gained for me, 
is Corban. That is given to God. Then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and many such things you do. It's amazing how the traditions of men get in the way of what God truly desires. And look what he says. You honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. In vain they worship me. Hear this. Church, aren't we here? I mean, isn't this like what we, we are seeing in our world today? They honor me with lives, but their heart is far from me. Listen to me. I, I'm not saying it in a self-righteous fashion. I'm saying we better check our hearts. Because here's what I feel like the Lord is doing in this day. Listen to me. He's doing the same thing he did when he came. He is provoking us. Doing what? He is calling us to action. Do what I say. Don't just say it and not do it. Come on. Are we vessels for him? Are we vessels of honor that want to serve him and obey him and do what he says? He says, in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Can I tell you something? Nothing supersedes God's word. Doesn't matter what culture says. It doesn't matter what anyone says. Nothing supersedes God's word. And when we stand for God's word, yes, they're going to champion you and hold your hands up and say, you won. No, they're not. They're going to say, mm. they're possessed. Come on. They're too narrow. They don't follow this, they don't follow this, they don't follow this. Do y'all hear this? I, I don't know about you, but this, this uh, our world has, gotten, has gone from a two lane to a four lane to an eight lane to a 12 lane to a 24 lane. Wide is the road that leads to destruction. Y'all just all jump on, we're all good. Like who's over there on that little path? Like following in an orderly fashion. Who is that? Oh, those are the people of God. Don't pay any attention to them. Look how slow they're moving. But we're on the express lane. ACDC wrote a song about it. It's called the highway to hell. I'm serious. It's called the highway to destruction. Because see, God is still provoking us today. Why did he provoke them? He provoked them. Listen, his provoking was necessary to bring about his substitutionary death, burial, and resurrection. Now, here's my question. And, and, I, and, I, and I put this up, but, but I came up with a better one as I was sitting here during worship. But he still provokes us to bury our ways and to be resurrected to new life in him. There's still things he needs to provoke and kind of, Stir up within us and get rid of it. Would y'all agree with that? Okay, so Lord provoke us. Y'all stand with me. But how about this? <laughs> he is provoking us. Wow. And he's provoking even what has taken place in the world. If you think God's not in control today, you're wrong. He's been in control. He will always be in control. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He has never lost control. It's not like we're trying to, oh, God, would you please still be in control? No, he's got it. Had never gone anywhere. Seated on his throne, Revelation, right? Revelation chapter 4, chapter 5. What? The one who is worthy to open the scroll. He's got it. But don't you think that some of the reasons that he is provoking today, even his name provokes agitation in people now. Even his name is being marginalized in different places. Even those who are part of the faith and believe the word of God, disbelieve this, just this, just 
the Word of God. Like, I believe the Bible are seen as narrow. No, no, no. But listen to me. The provocation is necessary. Get this. To bring about the desired end. So, Lord, keep us strong. Heavenly Father, keep us, Lord God, as a people who go hard after you. Heavenly Father, who are not caught up in the traditions of men, but Heavenly Father, who hold your word, Lord God, as the lamppost and the guidepost for our lives. Your word, Father, is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. God, forgive us when we have strayed. Lord God, when we have looked at things through the wrong lens, when we have even seen people through the wrong lens. I love it. It says, Christ knew their hearts, but it grieved him. Father God, let us grieve for the lost. Lord God, not as a lost cause, but so that our prayers will be effectual for them. Heavenly Father, we lift up those who have hardened their hearts to you. God, we lift up those who are caught in sin. We lift up, Heavenly Father, those in government and in religion, Lord, who have turned a blind eye to you. And Father God, we pray for the healing of their hearts. God, we also bring ourselves before you. While we're trying to remove the speck, Lord, help us to make sure there's not a log in our eye. Father God, forgive us when we have gone astray in our thoughts, Lord. When hate has consumed us, or God, a mistrust for people. Or, or Lord God, thinking everyone has an agenda. We know the only agenda is the agenda of the enemy because we don't wrestle with flesh and blood. So we lift our brothers and sisters in Christ to you and we lift the loss to you. Lord God, we pray that your house will be filled and God, that none should perish, but all should come to eternal life. Heavenly Father, help us to use our sphere of influence for the kingdom, no matter what they say or what they do. And Lord God, as Jesus said, we will take up our cross and we will follow you. We will not love our lives even unto death. Let it be so. In Jesus' name, amen.